So, hello everybody. It's great that there's still quite a number who had found their way at this late stage of the uh, conference into our room and into our session on schizotypy in use. Unfortunately, Martin Debanet, who should have been the chair today, uh, could not make it. There was a, co a collision in uh, appointments. Um, and so you will have to do with me. And uh, also there is a, a change in the speaker for the first talk. Um, Neos uh, Barrantes Vidal could not come, uh, unfortunately, for health reasons, so uh, less uh, nice uh, event. But instead, we are happy to have uh, Paula Cristobal replacing her um, and uh, to give her talk on impact of childhood adversity, genetic variation, and their interaction on psychotic-like uh, symptoms and stress reactivity in psychometric and clinical high-risk samples. Paula, please. Uh, thank you. As a previous mention, Neos couldn't be here, so I'm going to present the work of our group in Barcelona. Uh, current approach conceptualizes schizo schizotypy as the underlying vulnerability for schizophrenia spectrum psychopathology that is expressed across broad range of personality, subclinical, and clinical manifestations. Uh, schizotypy and schizophrenia are multidimensional constructs where positive and negative dimension are the most consistently replicated. A uh, positive uh, dimension has been associated with abnormal stress sensitivity, where negative dimension has more consistently associated with cognitive deficits. Uh, um, subclinical and, uh, well, according to this model, um, phenomenological and etiological continuity exists between subclinical and clinical manifestations. So focusing on subclinical manifestations is useful for identifying risk and uh, resilient mechanisms without the confounding uh, factors associated and, and all uh, and long-term ill status. So, uh, focusing on these risk and resilient mechanisms across the psychosis continuum, uh, several uh, SNPs has been investigated uh, in the, across the standard psychosis phenotype, given their functional uh, implication in the, in the biologically relevant systems on stress regulation. And, uh, and then similarly, uh, childhood adversity and momentary stressors are associated across the extended phenotype. And importantly, uh, gene environment studies have shown that this SNP interact with uh, both uh, stressors, increase the risk for psychotic experience. One of the most studied neurobiological mechanisms involved in the, in the association of the stress with psychotic experience is the deregulation of APA axis. And the genetic variation involved in this deregulation has also received particular attention. Uh, this is the case for, for example, of the FKBP5 that, among other functions, regulates the sensitivity of the glucocorticoid receptor involved in the HPA axis uh, uh, regulation. And importantly, the minor high induction alleles of, on at least four SNPs has been associated with a normal stress response. Uh, evidence also suggests that this regulation may precipitate a cascade of events leaving a dopamine sensitization in key brain areas. The functional polymorphism uh, affects the activity of CMT, which is involved in the inactivation of catecholamines at the postsynaptic sites. And MedMed genotype has been associated with a decreased CMT activity and subsequently high levels of dopamine in the prefrontal cortex in, comp in, 
in comparison to Balbal genotype. Uh, another candidate for understanding individual difference in the response of the dopaminergic and stress uh, response systems is the neuropeptide oxytocin. Uh, the interconnections between dopamine and oxytocin systems has led to the suggestion that individuals with more efficient variants on the genetic variation of oxytocin receptors, for example, GLEs, uh, may regulate more adaptively the salience assigned to social stimuli, thus diminishing susceptibility to psychopathology. Uh, so today I am will focusing on the res these research questions. The first one is environmental adversity, increased psychotic response to stress in daily life. Is this psychotic reactivity exacerbated in individuals with high positive schizotypy? Is this psychotic reactivity moderated by gene environment interaction? And the last one, is the psychotic reactivity moderated by genetic variation across different levels of the psychosis continuum? That's meaning non-clinical and early psychosis sample in people uh, without need for care and people with need for care. All the studies that I'm presenting today, we use experience sampling method, which is an structured diary technique in which participants are, prom are prompted throughout the day. Uh, and ESM offers several advantages to traditional assessments. Uh, improve ecological validity by assessing participants in their daily environment and uh, minimize retrospective bias by assessing participants at the time of the signal. In our studies, uh, participants were prompted eight times per day during a week and complete current uh, questionnaires about uh, symptoms, psychotic symptoms, about stress, and we uh, distinguish between uh, situational stress and social stress. We first use the item uh, asking if the participants were alone or with other at time the, the signal to distinguish social contact uh, social stress. If they were with others, uh, we ask if they f felt close to these people or if they prefer to be alone. And if they were alone, we, f we ask if they feel unwanted by others. So in the first study, we examine if the childhood trauma adversities moderate the association of stress with symptoms, and we found that all the stress indicators, but not social contact, were associated with symptoms. Uh, and all the childhood adversities investigated uh, increased psychotic reactivity to, uh, to a stress, to some form of stress. Importantly, abuse, neglect, bullying, and loss uh, show a psychotic and or paranoid reactivity to situational and social stress, whereas gen general traumatic events uh, show psychotic-like reactivity to situational stress. This suggests that all interpersonal adversities were relevant to increase psychotic response to interpersonal stressors. And collectively, the findings support the notion that the stress, stress reactivity is a critical mechanism in the positive dimension of the psychotic phenomena. In the second study, you, we examined if the uh, positive uh, is if the association between stress and symptoms was moderated by different levels of positive and negative schizotypy. And we show that the, all the stress indicators were, were associated with symptoms, but not with, the, but not with experience, not thoughts or emotions. And as expected, all these Association were moderated by positive schizotypy. 
So in the non-clinical sample, that it's the same sample that in the study before, um, we found that the, the, the psychotic reactivity was only for these participants that was high in, in positive schizotypy. In the third study, we examined if the interaction between bullying and FKBP5 moderate the association of stress with symptoms. And we found that the FKBP5 did not moderate the association of stress with symptoms. However, the interaction moderated the association of feeling unwanted by others when I am alone and, and symptoms. This means that the association between feeling unwanted and symptom was significantly increased by exposure to bullying, all in participants with the risk haplotype. This underscores that the genetic risk, distal and proximal stressors has an impact in, on the psychotic experience and provide support to the sensitization hypothesis and lend further support to the relevance given to the socially defeating appraisals in the real world expression of psychotic experience. Uh, in this study, we examine if the genetic variation on CMT, uh, oxytocin receptor, and the combined action interact with trauma. Uh, increasing psychotic reactivity to social stress when with others. And we found that the genetic uh, variation did not moderate the association, but the interaction with trauma moderate the interaction with the number of metalleles with trauma, moderate the association of preferred to be alone with symptoms, and uh, importantly, the combined action with CMT and oxytocin receptor moder moderate the association of both social appraisals with symptoms. This means that individuals with a high number of MET and GLEs and exposure to interpersonal trauma show greatest, uh, greater psychotic reactivity to both types of social stress appraisals diminish uh, social closeness and prefer to be alone. So this suggests that the same genetic variants could be associated with risk in adverse environments, but maybe also related to the resilience in positive environments. In the last study, we, we examined if uh, genetic uh, variation and distal or proximal uh, stressors uh, impact on psychotic experience in non-clinical and clinical uh, participants. And we examine a step by step all the, all the factors involved uh, uh, to arrive at the three-way interaction. And we found that unlike genetic variants, both stressors were associated with a psychotic-like experience. Uh, but importantly, in both cases, these associations were, were stronger in early psychosis group compared to the non-clinical group. And regarding the three-way interaction, we found that the FKBP5 risk haplotype interact with childhood trauma, uh, increasing psychotic experience in the early uh, psychosis individuals compared to the non-clinical one. So, in conclusions, uh, stress sensitivity is a mechanism involved in the experience of reality distortion across the extended psychosis phenotype, including non-clinical and early psychosis individuals. Uh, consistent the con with the continuum hypothesis, early psychosis individuals shows a greater increase in psychotic experience in response to distal and proximal uh, stressors in, com in comparison to non-clinical participants. The FKBP5 haplotype with distal environment factors increase the real-world expression of psychosis. The interaction of bullying with FKBP5 increased psychotic reactivity to social stress. And another distal interpersonal adversities uh, like the combination of self-report abuse and neglect with CMT 
an uh, oxytocin receptor uh, exacerbates psychotic reactivity to social stress. And all the studies that I'm presenting today uh, highlight the, ut the utility of daily life assessment to study subjective uh, process with important translational implications. Thank you for your attention. Do you go through with the participants to make clear what you mean, f for example, with this unusual sensory experiences so that they kind of know what you target uh, you before mean, you give them the, the experience sampling yeah, methods? Yeah, obviously, uh, we, uh, we use the protocol with the same with the non-clinical and with the clinical participants, and we explain what is the meaning of its uh, experience, no, and we, we explain uh, we, which is the meaning of, of this particular uh, psychotic symptom. Mm -hmm. And and uh, where? How did you sample your sample? Was it kind of a random sample from the general population from the register, no. or did you have like advertisements? In, in university? Uh the non-clinical sample uh, was uh, oversampled for uh, schizotypy, mm -hmm. but, it was the, the, but it was the second follow-up of the, the first one for the, uh, a big uh, recruitment of participants, mm -hmm. and of this big uh, sample, we select, uh, well, a subsample of, of this population. And with high schizotypy, you use uh, Wisconsin the, the, scale? The, the oversample yeah. of schizotypy was only for an, ensure a good representation mm -hmm. of schizotypy. But in the sample, there are uh, people with uh, high uh, schizotypy or low schizotypy. And, and the sch is schizotypy measure was the Chapman scales? Or uh, yeah, the uh, Wisconsin Scott Scott scales. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, okay. So, any other question? So thank you very much for this nice presentation. And the next speaker is Maud Schneider from Geneva or in Leuven. <laughs> so soon be back in Geneva, yeah. <laughs> and she will talk on stressful life events uh, that modulate the expression of positive schizotypy in the 22Q deletion syndrome. Thank you, Maud. Thank you, Frauke. Um, okay, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure for me to be here to talk a little bit about uh, 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome. And um, for those who may not be familiar with this condition, just a brief overview. So uh, this syndrome is uh, caused in most cases by a three megabase microdeletion, which is mostly in most cases de novo on the long arm of chromosome 22. Uh, 22. And it has an approximative uh, prevalence of one in 2000 and between one in 2,000 and one in uh, 4,000 live births, but it is especially uh, prevalent in uh, referral for prenatal diagnosis, so less than one in 1,000 um, of prevalence. So this is a very complex uh, genetic disorder with many uh, phenotypic uh, manifestations, such as uh, heart malformation, uh, more common being, uh, for example, tetralogy of fallow. And uh, patients with 22 q also have very frequent uh, palate uh, abnormalities and velopharyngeal insufficiency. They have uh, also frequent uh, submucous cleft palate, and they have also immune deficiency and um, the 
half of the uh, patient have uh, mild to moderate to mild uh, intellectual disability and the great majority of them have also learning uh, difficulties so using a very um, large expressions of uh, cognitive uh, medical and uh, clinical manifestations but the reason why we are mostly interested in this condition is uh, its association with uh, psychosis spectrum disorders. So this is a, a recent study that was uh, published on behalf of the 22Q IBBC consortium, which grouped together uh, over uh, 1,400 patients with 22Q aged between six and uh, late adulthood. And uh, this study uh, showed that uh, the prevalence of uh, psychosis spectrum uh, disorders is uh, really high in this population. So in this uh, very large sample, it was uh, approximately 40% in the, in the adults, but what is even probably more interesting is that the really high prevalence of early onset psychosis. So in adolescent population with 22Q, you already have a prevalence of approximately 10% of uh, schizophrenia spectrum disorders. And in three, uh, two thirds of the cases, it's either schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. So really like uh, enduring most of the time uh, conditions. So there are a number of studies examining the predictors of conversion to psychosis in 22Q, and we recently published a study examining the, um, the um, validity of UHR criteria in this population to see whether it was uh, useful to predict the onset of psychosis in this population uh, on, average, oops, sorry, on average 32 months uh, later. And in patients, you can see in patients who did not meet UHR condition at baseline, only 4.5% of them uh, transitioned to psychosis at follow-up. But in patients who met UHR condition uh, at baseline, this percentage uh, went up to 27%. So you can see that these criteria are very useful and can be really uh, implemented in this population uh, with uh, uh, transition rates that are relatively comparable to the general uh, to other at-risk uh, population. But if we compare this percentage of uh, false negatives, so those who are uh, negative for UHR condition at baseline who still transition to psychosis, you can see that this pr uh, percentage is a bit higher than uh, what is typically reported in uh, the general population. So this might uh, probably suggest that other factors uh, really play an important role also in transition uh, to, to psychosis and that needs to be investigated. So moving uh, more uh, closely to the topic of this symposium, uh, schizotypy in 22Q has been um, examined more specifically in a study from uh, Eduardo Fonseca Pedrejo, who will also present uh, later in the symposium. And uh, he examined the, the structure, uh, the factual structure of schizotypy in 22Q and confirmed that uh, the structure was similar to what has been described in uh, the general population with a three factorial structure, uh, with a cognitive perceptual uh, factor, an interpersonal factor, and a disorganization uh, factor. And when compared to uh, health and controls, um, it was found that patients with 22Q uh, scored especially higher on the negative uh, dimension of uh, schizotypy and also very strongly on the suspicious uh, subscale. But contrarily, uh, controls scored also higher on the odd belief uh, subscale compared to patients with 22Q. So there were also dimensions of schizotypy that were lower in patients with 22Q. And um, in this uh, study, uh, correlation between uh, schizotypy scores and uh, UHR symptoms were also investigated and uh, there were positive uh, association as we could expect between UHR symptoms and uh, positive schizotypy. So in this study, we were particularly interested to examine the influence of stressful life events on uh, schizotyp uh, schizotypal expression in 22Q uh, with regard to the di dietary uh, stress model of uh, schizotypy. So in the general population, there are some evidence of this that uh, the perceived um, 
severity of stressful life events is uh, significantly associated with schizotypal uh, expression. And there is higher evidence for positive schizotypy, but also a bit for uh, negative schizotypy. But what should be noted is that in most studies, it's really the impact of very serious life events who were examined, such as childhood trauma, as uh, Paola Navarre has uh, examined in her study, or rape, or very serious events, and not like um, more uh, frequent, but also less severe uh, stressful life events. And in the general population, several moderators were also identified, such as stress reactivity or uh, maladaptive uh, emotion regulation uh, strategies. So in this study, um, so what you should know is that in the 22Q literature, there is really a paucity of studies examining the influence and of environmental factors on the li liability to psychosis. And I think this is probably because uh, uh, of, the, um, of the genetic origin of 22Q, I think people really tended to focus more on uh, like genetic factors or even cognitive factors or uh, biomarkers, but not really on the environment. And I, I think this is really something that is still missing in this literature. And uh, if you are working with patients with 22Q, you can really uh, observe that those patients tend to be very reactive to even very min minor stressors in their environment, such as, for example, the beginning of the school year, they tend to uh, trigger the emergence of um, uh, abnormal perceptual experiences, for example. So in this study, we wanted to describe the prevalence of stressful life events in uh, adolescent and young adults with N2Q, and we also wanted to explore the association between stressful life events and uh, schizotypy. So we included uh, 56 patients with N2Q and 30 healthy controls, and none of the patients with N2Q had a formal diagnosis of uh, schizophrenia spectrum disorders, and they were all aged uh, 12 years or higher. And we assess them with the Coddington Life uh, Event Scale, which is a self-reported uh, instrument, which uh, combine um, uh, items for like more traumatic events, such as the death of a parent, but also more uh, like milder uh, stressful events, but still uh, important events, such as hospitalization of a parent, but also positive stressful events, such as uh, starting to date uh, someone. And uh, the, the events can be categorized in uh, recent events, so events uh, that happened uh, in the last six months, and less recent events, so events uh, that uh, happened between six and uh, 12 months. And there, uh, for each event uh, that is uh, checked as present, a stress, uh, a stress load uh, a number is attributed to each event that is uh, that was defined uh, based on uh, normative uh, uh, studies. And so you can really examine either the impact of the number of stressful life events or the stress load of, uh, of the events. And for the schizotypy, we use the, the SPQ questionnaires, uh, which is, uh, as I was presenting before, divided in three main dimensions, cognitive perceptual, interpersonal, and disorganization uh, dimensions. So when we examine the, pre uh, the prevalence of stressful life events uh, in controls and in patients, um, contrary to what we expected, we actually observed a higher uh, prevalence of stressful life events in the control sample. So uh, on average, um, only 17% uh, of, the, of the controls reported no uh, stressful life events in the, in the previous six months, and uh, approximately half of the patients with 22Q reported that they, they didn't experience any stressful life events. And uh, the stress load was also, on average, uh, uh, higher in controls compared to patients with 22Q. And the pattern was very similar for, for less recent events. And when we examine the, first the association between schizotypy and uh, the number of recent uh, events, we found no significant association between uh, either in patients or in controls. And this was the case uh, for recent events, uh, also for less recent events. But when we examine the association between the stress load and the uh, 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 schizotypy, we observed that uh, both in patients and in controls, we observed significant association with uh, increased suspiciousness 
And in patients, we also uh, uh, observed a, a significant association with IDs of reference. And in controls, we observed a significant association with uh, the disorganized uh, dimensions of uh, schizotypy, especially odd speech and odd behavior. But on the contrary, we observed no association between uh, the stress load of uh, less recent events and schizotypy. So, um, to conclude, I think uh, we were quite surprised to observe that the prevalence of stressful life events was a lower in patients with tinted UQ. And I think that could be due to a number of factors. So, uh, the fact that the environment is in itself a bit more protective, that pa parents tend to be more involved uh, in, the, in the daily life care of the, of the patients, and they tend to maybe sometimes even overprotect uh, those children, which may lead to uh, actually uh, lesser exposure to, to stressors in their daily life. But I think we should also keep in mind several limitations that are inherent to the, to the questionnaire that we used. Um, so the first limitation may be uh, the use of also positive stressors in this scale. And uh, for example, we know that patients with tinted to q uh, uh, are, uh, have a lower tendency to be, for example, involved in uh, romantic relationships. And if you assess this kind of events as a stressful life uh, event, uh, that could also uh, be one of the reasons why we observed a lower prevalence. And I think uh, another uh, limitation of this questionnaire is that the stress load was not subjectively determined by each participant. So it was really in a priori uh, uh, stress load score that was attributed for, for each event. And I think it's very likely that the same event, for example, uh, hospitalization of a parent could have very different impact from one individual to another. So I think this should uh, really need to be um, assessed further. And uh, in this questionnaire, there are also three items that uh, participants can report. So is there another event that happened to you that it was not listed uh, on the questionnaire? And these items were not analyzed in the context of this uh, study. Um, and regarding the association with schizotypal uh, manifestation, we observed, and I think that is quite interesting, that the stress load was uh, much more associated with uh, schizotypy than the number of events that was reported. And um, we um, also observed more effect for uh, the, le uh, the more recent events, so those who happened uh, within the last six months. Uh, so I think this is uh, maybe an indicator that uh, stressful life event could have a temporary effect on uh, the level of schizotypy in patients with tend to cure, but also in controls. But this should also uh, keep in mind that there could be a retrospective bias uh, for the more, uh, the less recent events that uh, they, they were, uh, there was a tendency to underreport um, events that happened uh, uh, a while ago. And uh, in controls, we observe some significant association with disorganized schizotypy. And I think this is quite interesting because in the study uh, that compared uh, schizotypy profiles between uh, patients with tinted 2Q and controls, uh, we already observed that uh, some aspects of disorganized schizotypy were more present in controls compared to patients. And uh, this is really the same dimension that uh, were also here in the study influenced by uh, the prevalence of stressful events. But but in 22Q, we observed really uh, only s a specific association with positive schizotypy, uh, especially suspiciousness and ideas of reference. And I think this might uh, suggest that uh, the impact of stressful life events could be re really implicated in the development of uh, more uh, frank manifestation of uh, psychosis. But uh, I think we also need to, to conduct longitudinal studies on this topic because uh, it has been suggested in the literature that sometimes a uh, patient who already have some uh, schizotypal uh, manifestation could be at increased risk of um, experiencing stressful life events because, for example, they have a higher tendency of being bullied. And uh, I think in this study we, we couldn't uh, examine that because it was cross-sectional uh, design, but I think this is uh, also something important to, to keep in mind. 
And uh, regarding the future perspective, I, uh, I think this is a topic that we definitely want to examine further, and especially using the experience sampling method, because I think this is a very well uh, suited way to examine the impact of stressful life events in daily life, and to really focus on the subjective appraisal of the stressful life events in, uh, in patients. And uh, we are starting now to, to, to collect a sample of patients with uh, DQ using this technique. All right, so uh, thank you for your attention. And this is uh, the Geneva group, uh, which also uh, helped me to, to conduct this uh, study. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maud. We have, have time for questions. If there are any. Yeah? A very nice presentation. Um, when you look at the difference between, or the finding that uh, there is yeah, less live events uh, in the patients with 22Q, it actually is quite, um, it's similar to what we found in patients with uh, schizophrenia, where we also ex anticipated more live events than actually there weren't, and we hypothesized that it was due to people having actually adjusted to their uh, vulnerability and then just live a, a life with less stressors Stress. in it. Yeah. Um, so, do you now said, yeah, probably it's due to the parents who are protective, but could it also be due to the patients themselves that either they have adjusted to their own vulnerability or that part of their vulnerability is that they're not that sensation seeking, so they're not really seeking out experiences and therefore probably do not encounter that many stressful experiences? Yeah, so that, that could be also indeed, uh, thank you for this uh, alternative explanation. I think that could indeed be the case because we know that these patients tend to favor uh, solitary activities, for example, uh, when they have free time. So they uh, tend to uh, enjoy watching movies or being on the internet and instead of uh, being with others. And I think that could also indeed lead to uh, a lower exposure to, to, to stressors in their daily life. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Further questions? <laughs> if not, then I would uh, thank you. Thank you. And um, we go to the third speaker. You have already been announced during the talk. Um, Eduardo Fonseca Petrero. Mm -hmm. I hope nice, I had nice. the R's right, in the right <laughs> anyway. place, on schizotypal traits and neurocognitive functioning in adolescents from the community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Eduardo Fonseca from uh, La Rioja. Um, for me, it's a pleasure uh, to talk in this symposium uh, with my colleagues. And, uh, first of all, I would like to say Mahtan to invite me in the symposium. And I think that it's quite interesting to have a symposium about this cathotype in this conference. So. Uh, for me, it's a really nice place to explain something about the schizotypy today. So I'll talk a little bit about the relationship between schizotypal traits and neurocognitive functioning in, in adolescents. So as you know, that uh, higher mental function like working memory, language, executive function are coordinated like, like in a library. But in certain mental disorders, uh, such uh, uh, higher mental processes are non-structured and in some cases disorganized. Uh, but as, as you know, before to the clinical transition to a psychotic disorders, we have a lot of approach to early identification and detection of those uh, participants at risk for mental disorder, and in this case, psychotic. So in this uh, figure of Keshavan, uh, we saw two aces. One is the time and development stage, and the other is the, the severity continuum of the impairment functioning, and you have a lot of... Uh, Approaches. One is the early at risk mental or early at risk state. The the second one is the late at risk mental state. And in each uh, state, you can find several uh, ways to uh, to 
to detect this kind of participants. Uh, in our case, we are moving in, in this Skytochapel trials or psychotic-like experiences, but we are thinking that we can combine these uh, psychotic-like experiences or Skytochapel trials uh, with neurocognitive at population level. Um, uh, only a few words about the Skytochapel trials. Uh, as you know, it's one of the uh, phenotypic expression of the Latin liability of psychosis called Skytochapel. Schizotropal trials are, are genetically continuous with schizophrenia, are associated with a greater risk of transition to psychosis, not only in general population, but also in genetic high risk and ultra high risk samples. Uh, share the same uh, risk factor for psychosis like uh, trauma, cannabis, urbanicity. Uh, those participants who score higher in schizotypy measures uh, show similar deficits than those found in schizophrenia patients. And as Modo uh, told before, that we found the same factual structure of three higher order factors, and uh, schizotypy measures uh, are quite convergent with the ultra high risk. Uh, measure too. But the other way, we have a neurocognitive deficit. As you know, there is a core feature of the Schizotypy syndrome, and there are a lot of impairments across uh, several domains, and uh, there are also deficits in children who develop uh, psychosis later in life. There are uh, neuro neurocognitive def deficits also in genetic and ultra high risk samples. Uh, in individuals who report psychotic symptoms, and also in individuals who report schizotypal trials and psychotic-like experiences. So perhaps we are talking about endophenotype of uh, psychosis. Uh, only a, a few words about the best papers in the, in the field. There is uh, this uh, meta-analysis of Fusar Poli. Uh, there are a new uh, interesting paper of Frog and his, uh, her team. And this is a nice paper of uh, the GUR team, uh, publicity in World Psychiatry, uh, in a random representative sample of adolescents and youth. He uh, taking account those participants who report uh, psychotic symptoms uh, and a control group. And as you can see, there's uh, two measures. One is accuracy, another is speed. Accuracy is the number of correct response in the task. And the speed is the median reaction time of uh, each uh, task and domains. But uh, they found a statistical significant difference in accuracy, but not in, in all, uh, all of the domains of uh, speed. There's another interesting paper of Kelleher in schizophrenia bulletin to test the same hypothesis. If there are some difference in neurocognitive functioning between control group or uh, control group and uh, uh, adolescents with uh, report psychotic symptoms uh, in interviews. So they found a statistical significant difference in measures to speed processing, but not in this one over there. And uh, in our team, in our field, we have uh, this paper of Cohen. Uh, and in this paper, they uh, review a meta-analysis of Skythochapi scores and the, those uh, studies to compare between high and low Skythochapi groups. And they found uh, only tiny difference between groups, and in all cases, uh, a small effect size of the difference. You have there the, the effect size of the difference. And for Neus Barrantes Vidal, I think that this is the first uh, paper in, in our field about the relationship between neurocognitive and uh, schizotypy in, in adolescent population. So perhaps we are talking about uh, the hypothesis of psychotic uh, continuity, and we can uh, run from general population to psychotic disorders, and perhaps across these uh, domains, we can find several levels of impairment in neurocognitive uh, domains. So to date, uh, really letting us know about the Latin structure of the schizotypal traits in adolescent populations. Uh, Latin profile analysis, the idea of the Latin profile analysis to identify homo homogeneous classes of individuals based on scores profiles. And a uh, new previous study had tested the, the relationship between schizotypal traits and neurocognitive in large and random sample of the general population using a specific measures for this kind of population. So uh, this is the, the main goals of the present study is two folds. One is, the, of course, the, the, to explore the Latin structure of the schizotypal traits, and another is to analyze the association between these classes and neurocognitive functioning. 
we uh, carry out a stratigraphic uh, random cluster sample in a cluster rebel in La Rioja uh, uh, with public and grand assisted secondary schools and vocational training centers, 34 schools, almost 100 classrooms. Uh, the final sample is around 1,600. The main age is uh, 16, ranges between 14 and 19, and you have the, the rates for value and for gender. This is La Rioja. This is a nice place to be. If you have time, I think that you can visit. It's the land of the wine. Perhaps some of you, some of, some of you uh, know the La Rioja. Okay, uh, so in instruments and measures, uh, we use uh, a lot of uh, a big project, but here only so uh, preliminary data of our project about uh, well-being in adolescents or during adolescence. So we use the SkizoQ. It's a specific measure for SkizoQPL tries in, uh, in adolescents with 60 items in liquor response of with five categories and 10 sub-scales in three higher order dimension. One is positive, another is an edonia dimension and social disorganization dimension. You have ideas of reference, magic thinking is more or less like uh, the criteria for a personality disorder. We use an uh, infrequent scale to, the, to detect those participants who respond in a random way with uh, 12 items mixed between all the, the, the subscales. And we validated this uh, very nice uh, battery. This the pen computerized neuropsychological test battery. It's free uh, if you talk uh, with Gur and his college. Uh, we adapted it into Spanish according to International Test Commission. It's one hour, uh, 14 tests, five domains. We uh, transformed the score in CETA scores. And we only use two measures. One is the accuracy, that is the, the number of correct response. And the second one is the speed, this is the median impression time. Here you have all the domains and the tags of this uh, battery. You have uh, execute control, the me uh, epic memory complex cognition, social cognition, and sensory motor. Only a piece of this battery, uh, you have there, like, a, for instance, over there, like a emotion recognition task, the MBAC task, whatever. I think that you, you know this stuff. So first of all, we run a Latin profile analysis. And here I show you the, the goodness of the statistics for the uh, Latin class profiles tested in the study. As you can see uh, here, the best uh, model was the, the four classes Latin profile model. It's the best, uh, uh, best good fitness in entropy and in the Lou Mendel Rubin radio test that is statistically significant. Then, when this uh, p value is statistically significant, is compared with the five Latin class that is not statistically significant. So, we retain here the four Latin class. This is the Latin structure of the four Latin class model. In our study, you have the Latin class one that is the lowest KSHIP or, or adaptative KSHIP. Uh, it's almost like 50% uh, of the population. You have the Latin class two that is the high, high risk group or highest KSHIP group. And also two groups that is one is the uh, positive group because it's scored higher in the positive dimensions of SkyTOJP and another is the social disorganization group that is scored higher over there is the, the purple one. So uh, we run multiple multiple uh, analysis of uh, of Manova, Mancovas, excuse me, uh, with taking account as gender and, and age as a copyright and here I show you part of our research. We don't, uh, we don't find any statistical significance across all domains and across all Latin or for Latin groups, but you can see here all, all the trends in the, in the data. In blue line, you have the, the accuracy of the, of the score, and here you have the, the groups, low, higher, uh, positive group, and social disorganization group. In blue line, you have the, the number of correct responses, and in, in red or in in orange, you have the, the reaction times. Here, um, the low group score uh, low, and here more or less the same. Uh, as you can see, there are a lot of variability between the data in the, in the high, high risk group here. For instance, in verbal memory and face memory, the high, the high risk group in our study score higher, or better, excuse me, than the than the low group here and here. 
the same for phase memory. In the domain of complex cognition, uh, the low SKZGP group is score, score better than the uh, highest group, but no statistical significant difference were found, again. And the same for social cognition, and here for uh, sensory motor attacks. In this task, we only have a ration time. We don't have accuracy scores. More or less, as you can see, is the similar scores between uh, all the, the samples. So, uh, in fact, we ran a, a new uh, analysis, MANOVA, uh, taking account the gender and age, and we dichotomized the, the groups according to the sky the dimensions, anedonia, social organization, a positive dimension and total score. And in this case, uh, we, f we, find, uh, we found uh, statistical significant difference in these domains. For instance, in Anedonia, when compared low and high uh, risks, we have here. In this organization, we have differences in attention. So, uh, using Latin profile analysis, uh, for, uh, for Latin classes were identified, low, high, positive social organization. In this preliminary study analysis, no statistical significance were found across the four Latin classes in neurocognitive performance. And adolescents who displayed higher uh, schizotypal traits almost show with the same neurocognitive profile in this study. So, some, some limitations and concerns. First is a, a, a study at population level, not just a high risk sample or ultra high risk sample or whatever. This uh, self report measure in SkyTHIP. In a psychometric high risk group, this is a small group, like 7% seven, uh, seven, of the population and with great variability. And in all analysis, we uh, saw a lot of imp uh, a great impact of the gender and age in, in, in SKHGP and in neurocognitive performance. Perhaps we can uh, take in account another scores in the, in the pen battery. We have a lot of data. And perhaps, according to Cohen, we can search about the subjective complaints and its relationship with uh, SKHGP. So for, I think that uh, it's quite interesting to, to, to identify a uh, relevant and um, valid population in adolescents in combination, in combination with other approaches, for instance, neurocognitive or neuroimaging, with the aim to improve our predictive validity and early detention, as well as to study etiological metrics. And now, uh, the decision we, we have to take uh, is uh, we are working to in experience sample methods in uh, four groups, a control group and high risk, uh, psychometric high risk, in genetic high risk and ultra high risk. We are uh, doing right now uh, EEG analysis. We are uh, studying relation with other variables like trauma, reflective function. We are collecting data about the ADN, clinical interviews, and we are doing a follow-up study. So this is a quote for you, and for finish the, 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 the talk, there's, it's easy to build a strong children than to repair a broken, broken man. So this is our, uh, my research team, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Eduardo, is there any question? If no one has a question, I have one. Um, did you look at differences, for example, in school level or school performance as a proxy measure of uh, like daily performance in terms of cognitive abilities? And do the classes vary in this? Yeah, we think that this is a preliminary, a preliminary data, but I think that we, we have to take into account two things. One, perhaps, is the school performance. We only have uh, four variables of school performance. This is the number of, the, I think that it's the, the achievement in, in the last year. Mm -hmm. And another thing that it, I think that is quite important is to take in account the multi-level, uh, the, the structure of the analysis that is a multi-level because the, the adolescents are clustering in classes, in schools, in neighbors. So I think that we can take in account the, these kind of, of things. Mm -hmm. So that's 
in future to come. Yeah, yeah, this is a preliminary mm -hmm. analysis, but uh, it's quite interesting. It's significant to not found a statistical yeah. significant because it's a specific measure for SKHP is a good battery for neurocognitive domains, so. Mm. And, and in comparison to, let's say, clinical uh, samples with schizotypal personality disorders, how s highly schizotypy were the schizotypy group? Was it just high in relation to the general population, or were they high even in comparison with clinical samples? Uh, right now, we are conducting a, a study uh, taking account the control group and high, and high SKHIP psychometric high rules and a, and a clinical sample, but uh, we are conducting the, the study right now. So, in, perhaps in two months, we have a, like a four groups with 50 uh, persons in each group, and perhaps we have to, to analyze the neurocognitive performance across all the domains and across all the uh, extended psychosis phenotype. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now I have the pleasure to announce the last speaker, Rahel Flückinger, from our group. And she will speak about how schizotypy measures might enhance prediction of psychosis in samples already considered at clinical high risk. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction. And thank you for the talks. Uh, it's really nice to have. Uh, symposium about this con construct from the view of schizotypy because it's an important construct in the area of early intervention. And so I'm going to start now. And as she already mentioned, I, um, to, we researched the role of schizotypy in the field of clinical high risks, so in clinical high risk samples. and. Um, in clinical high risk, uh, there are two approaches. Um, one approach is the ultra high risk approach, the ultra high risk criteria, and the basic symptoms, which um, are associated with pool conversion rates to psychosis in help seeking samples from 15 up to 55% um, at one year and respectively on f at five year, uh, four years. Sorry. Um, especially the attenuated psychotic symptoms as well as cognitive disturbances were um, especially most protective according to the European Psychiatric Association. Um, but to come and to just uh, make the bridge to the schizotypy construct, um, it's important to mention that basic symptoms um, are self-experienced subclinical disturbances um, in the cognitive and perceptual um, area, and there is an overlap between ultra-high risk criteria and, in particular, the attenuated psychotic symptoms from uh, which have the positive symptoms and positive features of schizotypy. And schizotypal personality disorders as potential indicators of a susceptibility to psychotic disorder. But uh, research on the liability on a more, um, on a less psychopathological level focuses on the schizotypy construct and it's almost um, researched in general population samples and it's dealt as a manifestation of uh, schizophrenia liability or vulnerability um, to uh, schizophrenia according to Mel and Radon. And it's a multidimensional construct as we already heard in the other talks. Um, with three underlying domains, like the disorganization domain, the interpersonal domain, also known as the negative uh, schizotypy dim dimension, and as well the cognitive uh, perceptual dimension, also known as the positive dimension. Um, schizotypy is accessible via self-report scales on a psychometrical level, and a common instrument are the Wisconsin schizotypy scales, maybe also known as the famous Chapman scales, and they show predictive power to uh, psychotic disorders, especially magical ideation scales and the perceptual aberration scale, as well as the social anhedonia scale, were associated with a psychosis transition 10 years later. 
Um, but it's also important to mention that high scores do not determine clinical relevance. And to show you this a bit more, I switch to my next slide. And here you see the schizotypy dimension I already mentioned. And you can see that they can be on a non-pathological level, which person maybe have high scores, but they never develop any psychotic disorder or any clinical disorder on a psychopathological level, but it can exacerbate to a, a attenuated psychotic symptoms when uh, the symptoms go more severe and in the combination of more functional decline and distress. Um, you also see the SPD, is, uh, this means a schizotypal personality disorder, which is also um, a manifestation of a clinical, clinical diagnosis, maybe, um, of schizotypy, which was underlying, like here, and it can exacerbate to a manifest psychosis. And here you see the basic symptoms I already mentioned, and they act as a trigger or could act as a trigger on attenuated psychotic symptoms or just on, on a schizotypal personality disorder. So um, in clinical samples, measures of the schizotypal personality disorders like the SPQ, um, which uh, measures schizotypal personality disorders are used and they are indicating a schizotypal personality disorder, diagnosis, or um, just some futures of them, and they were um, associated with psychosis, and almost only uh, so features from the negative dimension, like social maladaptation, uh, which means lack of close friends, or social isolation, were predictive. So when we look um, if the SPQ interpersonal factor and the Wisconsin scale negative factor um, tap uh, different constructs. Um, we, uh, we see that there is a lack of evidence in clinical high-risk samples um, about schizotypy scales and if they have a value on the prediction of psychosis. And thus, this was our target because we were interested in the cross-sectional examination of the association between clinical high-risk criteria and psychometrically assessed schizotypy in a clinical sample, in people seeking help because of mental illness or mental health problems. And we accepted the strongest association between ultra-high-risk criteria and, positive, and the positive schizotypy dimension because of those um, phenomenological overlap and a second aim was that we wanted to know the value of um, psychometric schizotypy as a potential additional predictor in, of psychosis in help-seeking people. And we expected, because of the findings I told you before, that the negative dimension would be um, the most promising scale um, predicting a psychosis. So I show you the instruments we used, and you see we used the Wisconsin schizotypy scales um, in a, a self-report measure in a paper pencil format, and we only used three of them. You maybe noticed the fourth one, this is social anhedonia. We um, sadly had to exclude this scale because we had a missing data, about 56 persons who didn't fulfill um, this case, and we don't we did not want it to uh, reduce our power, so we just excluded them from the analysis. So we include this, uh, this course from the magic alleviation scale, which uh, measures beliefs about invalid, invalid beliefs according to the culture, like magical thinking, and the perceptual aberration scale, which assesses um, sensory um, hypersensitivities, or um, abnormalities in uh, the perception of the own body. And then physical anhedonia, which um, represents a diminished experience or pleasure in, um, in sensory um, experiences like taste, smell, or um, other pleasured stuff. 
And then we um, had the um, clinical high-risk criteria, which were assessed with two um, semi-structured interviews. The basic symptoms were assessed with the schizophrenia proneness instrument, and the ultra-high-risk criteria were assessed using the SIPs. Our sample consisted of 128 health-seeking patients from two early recognition and intervention centers from Germany and Switzerland. And um, we had um, different assessment um, points, and so we assessed patients at baseline and at follow-up. And the follow-up varied in length of time between 12 and 101 months. And Within um, 15, at least 15 months, we had 36 persons who converted to a psychosis, and about 70% did not develop any psychotic disorder in a range of 41 months. And the, the persons who transitioned to a psychosis, we called converters, and the others who did not convert to a psychosis, non-converter. Here you see um, some social demographic, clinical and psychosis risk characteristic at baseline. The mean age was about 23 years. And we compared uh, groups. We compared groups um, fulfilling clinical high risk criteria to those who don't, and converters to non-converters. And as you can see, or I can show you now, um, there was a significant difference between the amount of um, minors, and there were significantly less minors in the clinical, in the clinical high-risk negative group, uh, in the clinical high-risk positive group, sorry, and in non-converters. And then there was a significant difference between the fulfilling of any other Axis-1 diagnosis, and you can see that clinical high-risk person um, were lesser had less another current uh, Axis-1 diagnosis. And then we compared um, the, the status if they have a clinical high risk or not, and converters had significantly more clinical high risk criteria. <coughs> um, to our data analysis, um, to see, to um, examine the, the relationship between um, the schizotypy scales and uh, clinical high risk, we made a regression analysis. And first, we made a stepwise binary regression analysis. And the positive clinical high risk state was the outcome variable. And in a second step, we made a multinomial uh, logistic regression analysis. And there we split off the different um, clinical high risk groups into only fulfilling basic symptoms, only having ultra high risk criteria, or a combination of both. And here are those results. And you can see that physical anhedonia um, was associated with having a positive clinical high risk. And also with having uh, only ultra high risk criteria as well with having the combination of both. And this was the only uh, significant um, predictor and showed stable um, association. Next, we did Cox regression analysis to um, see if, uh, to um, examine if the schizotypy scales um, make, a, make a contribution to the conversion to psychosis. And um, we included also um, other moderators to see if there are interaction terms who just can predict the psychosis in conjunction with schizotypy. And we made it in a stepwise um, method. And so um, in the first step, we made the significance level really liberal on 10%. Uh, and uh, predictors were computed in individually. And then those um, predictors who were significant at those level, we took in a final model, which they were all together then put in the multinomial regression, Cox regression, and there we set the significance level at 5%. And here you can see um, that physical anhedonia alone 
as well as in the combination with a positive clinical high-risk state as well as magical ideation uh, with a positive clinical high-risk state were um, in a first step um, took to take it in the next step and there you can see that only physical anhedonia in conjunction with a clinical high-risk status was um, predictive to a conversion um, to a psychosis within 48 months. And to show you this more specifically, you see here uh, is the negative uh, clinical high-risk status, and here you see a positive clinical high-risk status, and the green one are the converters, and the blue one, the blue line, are the non-converters, and here on the uh, side you see the physical anhedonia scores, and you see a higher scores are predictive in person, fulfilling clinical high risk, but not in those, not having a clinical high risk. So um, to give you an inspection on that relationship. Um, to come back to my hypothesis we, I just um, introduced in the beginning, we expected the uh, strongest association between ultra high risk criteria and positive schizotype P dimension, uh, which I cannot verify here. But we found a stable association between physical anhedonia and the clinical high risk state, mainly due to the ultra high risk criteria. And we assume that this is due to differences in uh, the assessment. So the overlap between the positive schizotype P dimension and ultra high risk criteria might be more on a conceptual than on a phenomenological level. And to come to the second um, hypothesis, um, we expected psychosis predictive value for the negative dimension, and this I verified in brackets, because physical anhedonia um, is just a can just be seen as a substitute of the negative schizotypy dimension, and it was only predictive in persons already fulfilling or having a clinical high risk for psychosis. So, physical anhedonia differs from those um, features of a schizotypal personality disorders from the negative dimension cluster, as I mentioned, the social maladaptation, holding predictive value of uh, psychotic development uh, in clinical high risk samples. And here I have you my take-home message. Um, so patients at a clinical high risk might be at higher risk to develop a psychotic disorder when also scoring high on physical anhedonia scales. And physical anhedonia may or might introduce an aspect related to positive, um, uh, to negative symptoms and conversion to psychosis in clinical high risk samples. And so for general population, so in non-clinical samples, the Wisconsin scales, which we used, um, are a good starting point and for psychosis proneness. And in help-seeking samples, so in clinical samples, physical anhedonia might act as a screener for an in-depth interview if a person fulfills or has maybe a clinical high risk. And um, as well as a predictor in those already fulfilling clinical high risk criteria. And future studies, future studies should therefore do more in-depth examination between schizotypy and clinical high risk measures on conceptual level and examine the psychopathological uh, similarities and differences um, between clinical high risk state and schizotypy and um, with a target to uh, better understand psychosis proneness in uh, clinical high-risk samples and to um, improve early intervention. And for that, if you are interested, <laughs> I have a later talk today about that future studies and you are invited to join me. So thank you for your attention and if you are interested in more in-depth information about those results that just pre presented you, you can read um, our article which was lately um, in the Journal of Abnormal Psychology and published online already. Thank you. Thank you, Rahel.
Are there any questions? Yeah, um, I start in the front. Thank you, very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering whether you had some hypothesis whether uh, why you had uh, only significant uh, association with the UHR criteria but not with the basic symptoms uh, yes. in your models. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are wondering why we just um, we just had that, that hypothesis. Yes, because there is a, an overlap um, which goes back to the development of the ultra high risk criteria and they um, just orientated on the schizotypy construct and also um, and the schizotypy construct also has its relation um, in the space of schizotypal personality disorder which is also criterion in the ultra high risk criteria. So we expected there would be there should be an overlap. No, because the basic symptoms tap some different constructs in early detection in clinical high risk um, because it's on a more um, subclinical level and with more insight and not in the, in the same area like attenuated psychotic symptoms. That's the reason. So, so maybe to add here a bit, um, we, we did not expect um, a, a great kind of overlap with the basic symptoms because there's so much defined as state factors uh, that come into what the person would uh, experience as a deviation from a very functioning, not from any kind of interpretation or how I like it or how I feel with a certain experience, but really with a, with a cognitive functioning in this regard. And this is not kind of scored in any way in, in any of these uh, schizotypy, more trade-like experiences where it's like how, how I feel with something or what, and if I always feel um, like this or how I experience or interpret the world. And, and so it's, it's far more clearly on another experiential level. So, Rudolf? Thank you, Frank. Uh, I'm not uh, familiar with the Wisconsin scales and wondered for the physical anhedonia, what would be the typical description of it? What, what would be a typical question that people would endorse? Mm -hmm. um, a typical question would be when I pass by a, how you say, bakery and it smells really nice about fresh baked bread, I don't enjoy that. I don't enjoy to put out my to put away my uh, shoes and walk over a really nice um, carpet which is really soft. These are um, sensory um, to take pleasure about sensory um, or enjoy sensory um, stuff like smell, taste, um, and other touches. Touches, yes. Does that help you? This is a question. It's, it's only advice. I don't know if you run a, a exploratory factor analysis with the scores of the Chapman scales. Perhaps you you uh, has a, a, a one-dimensional structure, and if you take in account the factor scores, perhaps you remove part of the error when you measure the construct, and perhaps if you rerun the analysis taking in account the factor scores, that's the the the, the real score in the Chapman. Perhaps you can find something else, I don't know, but it's, uh, when you only compute the raw scores, you have the, the, the true score and the error. So when you compute the factor score, perhaps you, you can find something in the positive dimension, I don't know, I, mm -hmm. it's only an uh, idea. Thank you for that suggestion. We already run factor analysis. <laughs> And I already re recommended uh, my later talk about that. And we also <laughs> run a structure equation model, which was really nice and really worth to see it. But I can, talk, <laughs> I can tell it here, but we found really two nice factors when running factor analysis with the Wisconsin scales and um, combining them with clinical high risk criteria. I show you here, we find a three factor structure with a cognitive dimension and the negative and positive dimensions. So, but your succession is nice, thank you. <laughs> okay, any further questions? If not, we can conclude a bit earlier. I thank 
the speeches, speakers for being here and for giving their nice talks and the audience for coming here, although it's close to the end of the uh, conference. Thank you. <laughs>